I'm really interested. Where do I sign up? Today, Sinom Didi, Abekai. In English, it's called an inaugural lecture. Um, Didi, when school is. So, see, I did. I yelled on the singer and I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing. We are also live. being live streamed. We are also here physically. So hopefully, first let me greet all of you in the name of our Father Jesus Christ. Amen. And in this program, I'm going to greet my leader, Professor Mashudi Gabana Maselesele. I come from Limpopo. I know how to greet people from Limpopo. 
Rob can awaken us and also introduce each of you, our new Obadiah. Thank you. Over to you, Prof. Can we clap hands for Prof? Thank you. Molwen, Injani, Butili Lenan, Akonto, Limasiari, Good afternoon, Dumelan, Amisheweza, Injani. Oh, not tongues. It's one of the South African languages. Thank you, Program Director. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal of Walter Sisulu University, Professor Rushila Songa, who unfortunately had an urgent emergency, work related, she had to go and attend to that. I'm now standing in her boots and I'm really honored to give a vote of welcome to all of you in this auspicious occasion. I'm saying that, that it's an unfortunate situation that the VC is not here because this is how, what she wants. And this date was uh, actually agreed to looking at her schedule, but unfortunately she had other engagements. And I know wherever she is, her heart is really with us. Program director, this is indeed an indication that we are a university in pursuit of excellence. And our academics are really positively responding to this journey. They have heeded to the call, and this is one of those. Let me now welcome the family of Professor Kanget. I think they are very important. I know they are connected online. I want to say to you, welcome to this event. I'm sure you are very happy that your dad, your, your, your parent has made it thus far. I want to thank you and say to you, as you celebrate this occasion, you should remember that we also want to thank you for the work that you have done because you supported him to the way he is today. You are connected online from different parts of the country of yeah, yeah, of the country, not only South Africa, but of the world. That shows that you were able to give away and allow him to go out and fly like an eagle. And for that, we feel you are very important and we want to give a special warm welcome to you. Can we give them a round of applause? We also want to welcome our colleagues and other guests who are connected online. I know there are many of you who are really looking forward, just like us. We are saying we are all ears and we want to welcome you. And I want to say as well to Walter Sisulu staff members, managers, members of management, members of EMC, and all other colleagues who are here. I think you need a round of applause that you really, out of your busy schedule, you are here. We want to welcome you. <laughs> to the Faculty of Law, Humanities and Social Sciences, a special welcome to you. You have really raised a bar, a very high standard. Just in May, we had another inaugural lecture from one of your own. And now, without any other faculty coming to the party, you decided to bring another one. I think they deserve a round of applause for that. Well done, Faculty of Law, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Well done. We are saying, the faculty is saying to us, you know, they say action are loud, actions are louder than words. Their actions are making a bigger noise to all other faculties. And they are saying to you, where are you, the other six faculties? 
they are saying, they are saying, we will build our academic institution through the work that we do. And they are showing that by what they are doing. And they are saying, we will supervise students. They are saying, we will publish our research in support of the vision of Walter Sisulu University. As we know, we are an impactful, technology-infused African university. So to the faculty, to the dean, and your team, we are feeling the impact that you are making. And go on without getting tired. I always say, when they say, if you can't beat them, join them. I say, if you can't beat them, make your mark and run away and build. And then they will know who you are and what you are made of. On that note, I'm saying to the faculty and the university at large, Let's continue to make that impact. Let's also develop more postgraduate programs and more develop even the little gangetes, you know, with the, the programs that we'll develop, we'll then develop and mentor the young ones. And on that note, I want to say a big and warm welcome to all of you. <laughs> Program director, now allow me to introduce Professor Kanget, because we are here and asking ourselves, who is Prof? Prof Kanget. Professor Simon Murote Kanget, who was born in Kenya, attained his Bachelor of Arts degree with second class honors, lower division, majoring in economics and sociology at the University of Nairobi in 1989. Since then, that was like a vitamin B corp. You know, when we think of vitamin and we talk about vitamin B corp, it's a stimulant that will make you have appetite to eat any food that you come across. So he got that vitamin B corp to study, not to eat. He has served many organizations, joined the United Nations in 2001 as a manager in the HIV and AIDS domain in Botswana, all the way from Kenya. You know, those who fly like eagles do not have boundaries. He also continued to study at the University of Botswana and pursued his master's degree in social work, concluded it and finished and graduated in 2004. Ah, you need to applaud him. <laughs> Remember, he was still working as a manager. And then he moved on and worked as a Skillshare inter with Skillshare International, which then seconded him to work with Botswana Network of People Living with HIV and AIDS from 2007 to 2009. As if that was not enough. You know, he said, Botswana, you are just very close to South Africa. Let me cross over. And then he went to the Northwest Uni the University of Northwest in Mafikeng and he did his PhD in social work in 2007. Can we applaud him for that? <laughs> then after that, he then decided I can become a part-time lecturer at the University of Botswana and Botswana College of Distance Learning from 2008 to 2010. Then later, he then joined the University of Forte in December 2010, and he began le lecturing in 2011. At Forte, he served in various capacities and won many different academic awards. I will just single out a few because I don't want you to stay here for such a long time. His CV is very long. He won the 2012 Vice Chancellor Emerging Researchers Award, which was then presented during the graduation, May graduation in 2013. Then in 2014, he applied. You know what eagles do? They take risks. He applied for his first NRF rating <coughs> and got a C3 rating from 2015 to 2020. 
Then he became a full professor in 2016, January. In 2019, he was the winner of the University of Forte Faculty of Social Sciences Humanities Vice Chancellor's Excellence Award in Community Engagement. Applaud for that. <laughs> Listen to this. He has supervised four, four postgraduate students, 44, 10 doctoral and 34 masters. Wow. These are the little gangetes <laughs> that he has developed. Do you want, don't fall on your chairs from your chairs. This one, he has authored 200 articles published in accredited journals and presented in 30 conferences in 10 different countries across the globe. <laughs> he has already reviewed thousands of journals and book chapters. He has also fundraised over 5.9 million within the period of 2019 to 2025. And this, the funding is in collaboration with UK and South African USDP collaboration. The grant that is con you know, involve universities in South Africa and one university in the UK. Of course, this is a DHET initiative, which is actually trying to accelerate the acquisition of doctoral qualification by academics in South Africa. We were very wise to appoint him as our professor. He joined us in August 2021. And then it was his turn now to review for his NRF rating to be reviewed. And he applied in 2022, and now he is C2 rated from C3, he's climbing up. C2 rated from 2023 to 2027. You know, those who understand research, if you check him on Google Scholar and you check the citation index, you'll find that he is amongst the best, amongst the black social workers and he's the sixth best social worker, social workers in the country who the citations are raising him to that level. I would want us to stand up as we welcome Professor Simon Murote Kangete as he is going to give us a lecture on parod paradoxes of cultural interventions in the fight against HIV and AIDS and other social ills in South Africa. Over to you. The Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs and Research, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Institutional Support, the Registrar, Campus Rectors, Executive Directors, uh, Senior Directors, Directors, Dean of the Faculty of Social Science, Law and Humanities, Deans of other faculties, the University Senior Librarians, Professors, Academics, Distinguished guests, the clergy, my esteemed uh, students, ladies and gentlemen, to God be the glory. Yeah, I've been uh, advised not to talk about uh, awards because uh, uh, my DPC has talked about it. So maybe let me start the, the focus on my lecture. Uh -huh. I have divided my lecture. Oh, I should have said the title. Oh, yeah. okay, yes. Let me go because if you ask me about my title, maybe I've forgotten. Yeah, okay. 
My title talks about paradoxes of cultural interventions in the fight against HIV AIDS and other social ills in South Africa. It was a, it was a big presentation, but I've tried to cut it. Eh? Uh, for the sake of my students, maybe uh, when we talk about paradoxes, you know, it's when you want to do something, but something runs contrary to what you are thinking about. In this case, we are trying to position culture as an intervention to raise HIV a response. But along the way, culture becomes a deterrent. This is why I have positioned paradoxes. That's how I've arrived at the word paradoxes. Okay, thank you. Then from here, just allow me to, okay, the focus of my lecture. I've given the introduction. Number two, I've given the HIV AIDS situation in South Africa. Number three, I've talked about the social ills, but due to time factor, I have preferred to talk about gender-based violence because it's still a pandemic. Then number four is the gist of my presentation circumcision as an asset to fight HIV AIDS and other social ills. Number four would be culture as a liability to HIV AIDS response. This is why it is becoming a paradox. Eh? There, the culture in, on one side is an asset, on the other hand it's a liability. That is where the issue of a uh, paradox is coming in. Then the final part, conclusions and the way forward. Okay, let me go straight to my introduction. Um, this celebrated inaugural lecture will explore various understandings of the concept culture, the situation of HIV AIDS in South Africa, as well as some other social ills bedeviling the region, such as incidents of gender-based violence, before discussing how cultural interventions are an asset against HIV AIDS and other social ills. Then a discussion on how culture and cultural interventions are a liability in the fight against HIV and other social ills will follow. The lecture will end with conclusions and the way forward and some bit of social work implication because I am a social worker. I'm a very proud social worker. That's what I tell my students. Eh? And I always challenge them to become proud, positively, not negatively. Okay, now, this uh, presentation is about culture. So it is very important that we understand what is culture. And due to time uh, constraint, I picked uh, maybe uh, a few um, uh, references and I actually presented my work because uh, I've written about culture and have produced uh, three PhD in culture, particularly the culture of circumcision. Yes. So, Madam Vice Chancellor, I cannot do justice to the subject of cultural interventions without unpacking the concept of culture in various contexts of the world. According to my work, I wrote in 2009, one of the book chapter called Inadequate Male Involvement, you can go over it. Culture represents a set of values, norms, and practices that are passed down the generation. Indeed, Culture influences behavior and is essential to human behavior and development. Apparently, culture has been a mirror of many societies and it presents subtle thinking, cherishes the values, its do's and don'ts. Culture sets the pace for change in any society. This is according to my work. Okay, in most societies of the world, especially the traditional ones, it is a culture that dictates how power is to be shared between men, women, and children, the treatment of boys relative to girls, and the supremacy of men of women in life, according to Jacques et al. Et, et al. This means that culture is instrumental or a deterrent to the process of gender empowerment and alignment and can determine whether a society can achieve a desirable gender paradigm shift that can give leeway to a desirable gender parity. This is according to my work in 2021. Uh, this therefore calls for cultural negotiation, cultural adjustments, and 
realignment to make culture development friendly. This is uh, the work of Siopol et al. It's one of the international book which uh, the University of Stellenbosch has honored me to review. And uh, the book review is being published uh, in two weeks' time. Okay? Perhaps why it is important to deeply understand culture and its underpinning is that it has increasingly been accused of lavishly offering a platform for human rights violation. Thank you. Now I go to number two, the HIV situation in South Africa. It is estimated that 39 million people were infected with HIV AIDS world, worldwide as of 2022, according to UNAIDS records 2022. It's also estimated that 25 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa are living with HIV AIDS and 8.5 million are in South Africa, according to UNAIDS UNA 2019 statistics. Although HIV AIDS data segregated into districts is not available, the Eastern Cape province in 2017 had the third highest HIV prevalence rate of 25.2 after Free State 25.5 and KwaZulu Natal according to UNAIDS 2018. Inopportunately or in unfortunately, HIV and AIDS remains one of, one of the diseases with higher mortalities in South Africa according to my research uh, in 2022 and UNIS uh, 2019. Statistically, the overall HIV prevalence rate was approximately 13.9 among the South African population in 2022. For adults aged 15 to 49 years, an estimated 19.6 of the population was HIV positive in 2022, meaning that one in five of the 15 to 14 group was living with HIV AIDS. Further, in 2022, the estimated number of deaths from AIDS in South Africa reached 85,796. However, this marks some significant improvement compared to the year 2021, when AIDS-rated deaths in the country reached nearly 80,000. 80, Reflecting on the HIV situation a few years back, the country in 2017 experienced 270,000 new infections and 110,000 deaths from AIDS-related illnesses. This is according to UNAIDS Statistic 2017. This has a serious economic impact, uh, making the country rank the most expensive antiretroviral program in the globe. This is recorded by my work in 2020. In 2015, for example, the country invested 1.34 billion US dollars to run the ARV program. This is again as the backdrop of the country doing poorly economically, according to Jonas 2017. Concerning it, South Africa narrowly failed to meet what we call the UNAID uh, targets of 90-90-90. Now, maybe I'll explain or unpack what it is. According to this target, 90% of those living with the HIV should know their status. 90% of those diagnosed should have received ARVs, and 90% of those on ARV should have achieved phylo suppression. Now, South Africa in 2020 just achieved 84, 87, 90, according to my work, 2023 and UNAIDS 2022. This makes it imperative for South Africa to work hard to achieve the UNAIDS target of 95, 95, 95. Uh, I think now you follow that 95% uh, uh, should have known their status. 95% eh? of those knowing the status should have been on ARV, and 95% of those living the virus should have achieved a uh, viral suppression. Importantly, the country needs to subdue the HIV state of stigma and stigmatization, as has been identified as one of the biggest handles besetting a successful fight against HIV AIDS. This is according to my student Mafunga 2017 and my work in 2023. Actually, stigma dissuades people from accepting the disease and promotes denialism and fear as a coping mechanism. Importantly, South Africa needs to address the state of feminization of HIV AIDS, which is brief to inform feminization of poverty. 
Maybe we need to listen to this and hear what is this feminization of, uh, I don't know whether I'll be able to open this link. How do we open? Oh, yeah. Maybe somebody should be assisting me to open the link. I don't know. Open the link. Let me see. Okay, let me see. Yes, it's, this is part of my work in the international community. The video is not talking. What do we, uh, can you somebody come and make it talk? <laughs> <laughs> it has been talking all along. <laughs> I don't know technology issues, eh? But if it cannot talk, feminization of uh, HIV AIDS is one of the drawbacks to our HIV AIDS campaign. Because what it's saying is that more women than men are infected with HIV AIDS. Eh? And so uh, communities are blaming women for HIV AIDS, especially men. And yet, we have documented in other journals that it is men who are perfect transmitters of HIV AIDS. In fact, uh, in my book, chapter 209, I have uh, communicated that men are five times more promiscuous than women. Men don't throw stones to me. Yes. <laughs> Technology problem now. I want to go down. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, ah, uh, yes, yes, I'm winning, I'm winning, eh? eh? No, I'm not winning. There should be somebody to, uh, to help. Uh, hey, other people are not very good in uh, this. Uh. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh. Uh, Dikone, Dikone. Madam Vice Chancellor, the low HIV AIDS disclosure rate in South Africa has been adversely affected uh, the campaign. Now, the low disclosure rate in South Africa may be attributed to the bitter history that saw in 1998 a lady called Gugulamini killed blood, uh, cold blood, cold blood delay by her community in KwaZulu Natal for disclosing to be living with the HIV AIDS uh, virus. I believe that was AIDS day. When she disclosed, her community just uh, drew stones to her and she died. Eh? So this bitter history has really informed uh, and affected the campaign of disclosure in South Africa. Those who know KwaZulu-Natal, I understand we have Gugulamini Foundation. Eh? I've not gone there to see it, but uh, the government put a foundation to remember her dead after disclosing. For effective disclosure, I advise that one living with HIV AIDS uh, needs to be adequately prepared socially, psychologically, and emotionally before just engaging in the process of decide whether to disclose or not. Finally and conclusively, the disclosure phenomenon appears to face an array of various deficits such as societal stigma to the people living with HIV AIDS, creating a platform of conflict with close kin and friends, jeopardizing opportunities for PLWA employability, deriving a state of apathy and life solos, and an environment benefit of adequate psychosocial support. These factors are believed to weaken the war against HIV AIDS in the Eastern Cape and elsewhere in South Africa, has making the area experience, experience a low disclosure rate. That's according to my work in 2020, yes. And now let me go to number three. I will not keep you here, yes. Other social ills I've just discussed about gender-based violence, eh? Hey, I was told how to increase this font. Can I even remember now, hey? How do I increase this font? Somebody should be there next to me. I'm an important person today <laughs> to assist me, hey, now I'm <laughs> to show me how. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Eh? Other social ills, uh, Madam Vice Chancellor, I'm struggling. The, 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 the numbers are very small. 
total annihilation of gender-based violence in South African region would be a panacea that will possibly, uh, will possibly effectuate a paradigm shift towards a state of gender equality and equity, as well as a significant score to the achievement and attainment of sustainable development goal number five that aims to achieve gender equality, equity, and empower all women and girls. This is according to my work in 2014. Yes, this is because gender-based violence today is indeed an epidemic, uh, moving towards being a national pandemic. According to my work in 2014, gender-based violence is painful, is horrendous, has pinching effects on the victims, and denies them their human rights to health and human treatment. Painstakingly, Myself, believe, I believe that gender-based violence is an archaic and barbaric way of expressing dissatisfaction by the perpetrator. It is highly dehumanizing as well as considered a demon calling for social, cultural, physical, emotional, spiritual exorcism. Yes, Madam Vice Chancellor, gender-based violence commonly takes the following forms. I'll just uh, summarize. Physical violence, we know it, like hating, slapping. Emotional violence includes humiliating or degrading treatment. Uh, sexual violence, we are aware of social violence, and even forced marriage these days is part of it. Perhaps an unfortunate hydrance to addressing gender-based violence, uh, Vice Chancellor, in many African countries is that women rarely report. Uh, the violence, unless it becomes unbearable or causes serious injury. This is because they fear the loss of economic support from men. It is because of poverty, feminization of HIV, and feminization of, uh, feminization of poverty, they are real. We need to deal with them. Okay, perhaps, uh, thank you, thank you. In my work in 2021, on a paper on gender, nuances and their impact on HIV AIDS campaign in the Aris region of the Eastern Cape, uh, I attribute gender-based violence to patriarchal power differentials that facilitate an emasculation of women's sexual health rights. This is a phenomenon that leads to feminization of HIV AIDS, which I have explained there before. Apparently, the evidence of gender-based violence cogently manifested during COVID-19 lockdown in 2020 in South Africa and other countries. You know about this. In fact, according to the study that I did in 2022 on responses of South African institutions of learning on COVID-19, uh, the, 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 there were 87,000 complaints that were related to the police in just one week. Eh? This really shows that gender is uh, an epidemic is slowly moving to be a giant pandemic. We need to stop it. Eh? Thank you. Yes, number four. Now we are in the gist uh, of this uh, presentation, circumcision as an asset to fight HIV, AIDS, and other social issues. I'm very proud that uh, my three students of uh, Ulualuko have finished their PhD. Yeah, so this is the literature with myself and them, uh, journals. Now, 4.1, the role of circumcision in preventing HIV AIDS and other social issues. Let's hear how we can prevent HIV AIDS through culture. Topically, the right of traditional male circumcision has since time immemorial served cultural and religious milestones of achieving adulthood, and this is uh, uh, by so many of us, 2013, Kangeve, and others. The right is meant for behavioral modification and refinement, which is a big plus in expanding the prevention of sexually transmitted diseases such as HIV AIDS. However, today, traditional male circumcision has undergone a paradigm shift, moving from achieving socio-cultural goals to the clinical goal of fighting HIV AIDS. We have documented so many journals about that. This is uh, through a clinical removal of the penile of our skin by a traditional surgeon, eh? uh, and a culturally defined processes. Inhibi, isn't it? Eh? Inhibi, eh? Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, 
a score of researchers, uh, many of us here and my students and lecturers appear to accept and advocate uh, traditional male circumcision and medical male circumcision as a clinical tool to fight off HIV AIDS in the South African region. However, there is a sharp contestation between TMC, traditional male circumcision, and medical male circumcision, with a number of the scholars blaming the government for supporting and undermining TMC. Yes, they claim that uh, the government is supporting medical male circumcision and undermining or neglecting traditional male circumcision. We have raised those debates in other journals. You read about them, eh? Those who read about my work, I have raised those debates, eh? okay? Now, Madam Vice Chancellor, it is estimated that eight to 58 boys died while attending initiation schools in the last 15 years. This according to daily life, uh, dispatch live in December 2021. This researcher, or myself, I exhort cultural custodians to effectuate a paradigm shift that you will see the estuarial culture of TMC regain its social cultural glory, adoration, and dignity, and be a vanguard and beacon of peace, chastity, and elegant behaviors. Eh? These are the issues, these are the factors that will increase HIV AIDS response. Madam Vice Chancellor, allow me to put a, a, a disclaimer that. Uh, TMC or even MMC cannot prevent an HIV AIDS infection, but meaningful protection will only happen if circumcision is used in tandem with other conventional methods such as uh, abstention as well as correct and persistent and consistent use of contraceptives. Eh? This is according to my work in 2020, and I've been, I've raised many things that are uh, you know, when, for instance, you are drunk, eh? you know, the issue of wearing a condom consistently and persistently cannot happen. You cannot guarantee. Uh, the literature indicated that sometimes people wake up in the morning and the lady is asking the guy, why didn't you use the condom? No, I use the condom. Where, 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 where? <laughs> so, so, well, uh, yes, we have documented this reality, not just to make you happy. So, Circumcision alone cannot guarantee, you know, prevention of HIV AIDS. Eh? It needs, you know, the support of other conventional and tested methodologies. Okay, moreover, a validation of the effectiveness of circumcision as a tool to fight HIV AIDS was de demonstrated in a research study done in 2003 in KwaZulu-Natal that found that men who had a went male circumcision were 60% safer than those who never went the circumcision. Eh? This has actually been our benchmark. Those who campaign about prevention uh, through Ulua Luko, we base our argument because this is a global research that was conducted and uh, these statistics have stood since 2003. Okay, number four, I'm about uh, three quarter away now, yes. Traditional healers in the fight against HIV AIDS in South Africa. Over 70% of black people use the services of traditional healers with South African being on the front line. This is because traditional medicine are more affordable and are more easily accessible than conventional uh, medicine. Further, in most African countries, traditional medicine are organically farmed and the patient actually believe in their safety because they are natural. The bigger clientele of traditional medicine in South Africa is people living with HIV AIDS. Eh? Asiomatically, traditional healers in many African countries are used as the first point of consultation for most ailments, regardless of their causes. People consult with, with traditional healers for treatment for major causes such as mafofonia, schizophrenia, and pandemics such as HIV AIDS, according to Dou Mambona in 2022. A further referential by the same uh, researcher Dou Mambona on traditional healing in HIV AIDS and AIDS management pointed out that traditional healing carried out effective treatment of some HIV AIDS related opportunistic infections such as diarrhea, skin lesions, and childhood diseases. Studies by Matianga et al. feel that 
African potato is used as an immune stimulant for the treatment of wasting diseases, testicular tumors, diabetes mellitus, urinary infection, and cardiac disease, among other conditions. However, some researchers, such as myself, cast aspersions on traditional healing in the fight against HIV AIDS. Uh, I have documented maybe in 2009 uh, the virtues or the good things of traditional healers and also the bad things and have compared them. And uh, the bad things really outweigh the good ones. Eh? It is debatable, but I'm waiting for other people also to write and tell me I'm wrong. This is a, this is a, a journal I published in 2009 in the journal called African Journal of AIDS Research, the virtues of traditional healers. Eh? Uh, because I was working directly with them, you know, advocating for their changes when I was working for the United Nations. Okay, um, this is because most of the therapeutic concussions lack scientific validity, such as including incisions to let the dirty blood flow out and inducing vomiting and diarrhea, which could lead to um, anemia, dehydration, and electrolyte imbalances. I have so many clients in Botswana who actually, when they went for the therapy to, from the traditional healers, they wasn't, and unfortunately, some of them died. Eh? I'm also concerned, eh, although it is in the uh, journals, about the ethics and morality of some of these traditional healers. I have to be very serious. Eh? I have to be very sin uh, sincere with you, because I had a family that read uh, the, the wife got to the traditional healer, and the traditional healer said that uh, the therapy cannot work when you are with your husband here. So uh, the wife has to be coming alone. You know what happened? After three months, the lady came back pregnant now. I was the district aid advisor. They had to come to me. I didn't know what to do, but it's what, what I did is not uh, to be discussed here. So these are some of the moral and ethical deficits eh, associated with traditional healing, despite having pockets of good things. Eh? It's debatable. We uh, researchers, we need to debate those things eh, in order to find out the answer. Okay. Studies in Botswana by myself eh, reveal that some traditional healers, especially in the first decade of 21st century, had a pernicious effect on the PLWA when the, they would wink them, you know, uh, usually for cash, for pecuniary gains that they could heal AIDS. We had a lot of problems really trying to convince the people that that could not work. Eh? This made uh, the PLWA visit the clinics and hospitals when they were debilitatingly weak, with some meeting their deaths in the hands of the healers. It's according to my Kangeda 2022, I've documented in one of the journals. In some rural areas, traditional healers are also known to advise their clients to sleep with the virgins as a therapeutic cure for HIV AIDS. This has increased rape cases for young girls. And uh, now let us watch uh, the following video. Let me hope that it will open. Or oh, it's me who is fearing, I don't know. Uh, let us see. Let's see here, because uh, I've, doc I've, I've presented this in the global world. Oh, I've forgotten, it's not talking. Somebody could have come and make it talk. I don't know, maybe it's touching somewhere. Huh? You want to help? Yes, it should talk. If it's not connected to the speaker, there's nothing we can yeah. do. Yes, but what the message is that the traditional healers, yes, I know most people have trust in them, yes, because they do quite a number of good things. But when it comes to issue of HIV AIDS, you know, they cannot claim that they are able really to help people living with HIV AIDS, eh? because many people, especially in Botswana where I was, they died. Eh? Okay, okay.
I'm not very competent uh, in this. Hey. Let me see. I want to go to the other side. Huh? Okay, get out okay. here. No, we get out there. Yes, mm -hmm. we want to be here. Next slide. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, young. It's good to be young, eh? Yeah, and use that younghood nicely, you know. Good. Number 4.3, embracing Ubuntu in the fight against HIV AIDS. Uh, Madam Vice Chancellor, we have written a very strong international book on Ubuntu, and I'm one of the person who have contributed on how we can use Ubuntu to take care of our elderly. However, in this context, it's the how can we use Ubuntu to fight HIV AIDS? Because people about talk about Ubuntu, 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 but now we want to practicalize it in the battle against HIV AIDS. Uh, okay, uh, this researcher believes that entrenching the culture of Ubuntu can create a fertile ground and environment for addressing and fighting HIV AIDS and other social issues. These will be a fruit when the Ranja South African society considers the religious and cogent application of all the underpinnings of Ubuntu by unpacking the concept from much of the theoretical phase. Maybe what am I saying? I'm saying that much of the Ubuntu remains theoretical. It is not being practicalized. Eh? Researchers are not seeing many people practicalize Ubuntu. That's the challenge I'm bringing. Uh -huh. By unpacking the concept from much of the theoretical phase, it is gravitating to and placing it in a larger practical phase. This according to my work, 2022 and 2023 are written about Ubuntu. Conceptually, the ideals and philosophy of Ubuntu are derived from the Kosa aphorism saying, umtungum tu gabantu, umtungum tu gabantu. Is that correct? Okay. Hey, well, yes, yes. Now, this aphorism is one of the cornerstone ideals of Afrocentrism that the success of the much desired processes of indigenization and coloniality, especially in social work, hinges on. Madam Vice Chancellor, we are fighting the battle of really uh, strengthening Afrocentrism as opposed to Western, is it Western-centric? Because we keep on saying that our curriculum is Western-centric. Western. 30 years now, I've challenged the, the, the global community. We cannot keep on saying our curriculum is Western-centric, and yet we are moving at the same new, new speed. <laughs> the problem now, it is high time we move to correct the quagmire, because this curriculum need to reflect on Afrocentrism, so that we are sure the curriculum is going to solve the problems that we are seeing. The problems are increasing yeah, and multiplying. And yet, we suspect as scholars that something is not right with our curriculum. Yeah? Something is not right with the way we are doing it. Thanks a lot. Yeah? Okay. Uh, these are for us, uh, uh, yes, okay. Ubuntu advocates for humanity and interconnectedness. Yes, okay. Historically, the philosophy of Ubuntu symbolizes love, humanity, uh, mutuality, reciprocity, and interdependence. Eh? These are the virtues that, if applied cogently and religiously by society, could afford the PLWA a state of positive living, happiness, support, and effective coping with the disease. This is critical because HIV AIDS in South Africa is one of the diseases with the higher rates of morbidity. According to my work, uh, 2022, expeditiously, the tenets of Ubuntu underscore and reinforce the spirit of being there for one another and offering a needy person a shoulder to lean on. The philosophy is often applicable to the PLW coping capacities through the assistance offered by close family members, kin, faith-based organization, and community members generally. Madam Vice Chancellor, I believe that a cogent and religious application of some tenets of Ubuntu can increase people's response to HIV AIDS. First and foremost, HIV is believed to proliferate because of stigma 
and its concomitant consequences of stigmatization. This is according to my work, recent work, 2023. Optimistically, the application of Ubuntu uh, the loss of it could aid and facilitate the much desired goal of destigmatizing diseases such as HIV AIDS. Uh, a study I did now in the journal of 20, last year in Aris, uh, Eastern Coop, that assessed the coping opportunities and deficit experienced by PLWA showed that applying the tenets of Ubuntu was instrumental in lacing the PLWA's coping responses. Some PL, PLWHA who experienced positive reading reported get assistance from family members and communities, faith-based organization, and mutual and reciprocal support from members of their support groups. The converse was true in that negative coping was caused by the PLWHA states of apathy, driven by poverty, lack of love, stigma, discrimination, abuse of substances and ignorance about disease etiology or the genesis and epidemiology, how the disease travels among people. Now 4.31, let's see what uh, advocacy of Ubuntu by faith-based organizations, eh? because they should not be left out. Most importantly, the role of different faith-based organizations needs to come in handy in advocating for Ubuntu-related values of love to one another, especially to people living with HIV AIDS. These organizations need to advocate for zero tolerance for, for, for factors such as alcoholism and sexual engagement outside marital relationship, sexual engagement outside, outside marriage, as well as advocate for so sexual abstention and being sexually faithful to faithful partners. Eh? Perhaps the biblical reference of these verses should perhaps be in their mouths. I picked uh, Proverbs 5, uh, verse 15, which is advising, drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. So you should get married if you don't, not married. Yes, yes, so because why spill the water of your springs in the streets, having sex with just anyone. It's harsh, but um, exhorting the faith-based organization to put these words into, into their mouths and talk widely and advocate. Uh -huh. Okay, let's, let's see another one. Then I picked uh, 1 Corinthians 7 too. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relation with his own wife. Eh? So I've said if you don't have wife, you have to get married, isn't it? You have no choice, eh? And each woman with her own husband, isn't it? Eh? <laughs> okay, this is NIV fashion. This unequivocally uh, points to a corrective responsibility to undergo a sexual chastity paradigm shift to exterminate or annihilate HIV aid, especially in African countries with higher preferences. Now, almost, I'm, I'm almost adding culture as a liability to HIV's response. 5.1, cultural beliefs and practices that promote uh, male pro promiscuity. Madam Vice Chancellor, about eight years ago, I think I was, remember I was in America, maybe uh, I can't remember the state I was. I engaged a global audience on how culture uh, can be a liability in the fight against HIV AIDS. As I take prayer, let us uh, here. Let's have a look at the following short videos. Let me hope. Hey, Asanda, if it doesn't open, you come. Hey, eh? 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 It's opening in Jesus' name. Hey, eh? it's opening. Hey, don't touch it. Oh, oh, but I'm forgetting it's not talking. Eh? Oh, 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 okay, okay. Now, if it's not talking, then uh, let's move to. Yeah. Not here. 
next one. So which one is this one here? Now we go down. Uh, culture is the Yes. I gave this microphone for the sound. The sound will be affected by this one because it's inaudible here. So it cannot play due to the... Okay. But if we remove everything, it will play. No, no, no. Let's do like this. Sure. my mouse. Who is the app for order? The mouse is not sensing. Oh, there you go. Beep. Okay. Ah, the next. Yeah. Ah, okay. Sound. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, no. Look at it. Look at that. You want to play the whole video? Now I don't know where we are. This myth has been propagated, especially by sub traditional healers with a Okay. Let's just forget, Let's just forget the videos. Mm. We'll just share okay. them. Mm. So this is your. Yeah. Okay, just go back there. Okay, yeah, sorry for that. Eh? Madam Vice Chancellor, uh, in many cultures in Africa, there are stereotypes that uh, a little man is not satisfied by one woman. And the society has proverbs to justify a man's engagement with multiple partners. Eh? Uh, this, this unfortunately encourages male promiscuity and male dominance and as a platform for increased vulnerability to HIV, AIDS, and gender-based violence. Uh, this uh, fights uh, evidence among many ethnic groupings in South Africa and its neighbors. The Botswana of both, uh, Botswana, the Botswana of South Africa, condone men's multiple involvement in many uh, women through the practice of the following proverbs. Eh? Don't laugh because uh, this Proverbs are documented in my work. Eh? Eh, meaning that you cannot lock a man in a claw like a bull. Meaning that a man should not be restricted to only one woman. This according to my... <laughs> don't love. Eh, this is why it's a paradox. Eh? You must understand. Yes. Now... Then another proverb in Botswana that is advocating for multiple and concurrent partnership is A man is like a beer carabash to be shared, which translates, no listen, please, please listen, which translates that a man has the freedom to associate with multiple and concurrent partners. This is documented in my book chapter. And now, uh, then the third one is Mona Selepe wa Mohanwa. A man is uh, like a nuts that can be borrowed by different uh, users. Eh? <laughs> now, uh, among the Chivenda, uh, maybe we have Chivenda people, the idea of multiple and concurrent partners finds support from the following program Mona Dindo, Halimuli, Muti Tiviets. That literally means a man is like an elephant that does not feed on only one tree, you know? Yeah. This is why it's paradox, eh? The Basutu have this to say about men, meaning that a man is like a pumpkin and he should be allowed to spread like a pumpkin by having <laughs> unrestricted partners. Yes, yes. Another stereotype condoning multiple and concurrent partners is Mona Habotwe Hore Otwakai, meaning that a man should not be asked by his wife where he slept uh, last night. Eh? Yes. Okay. This means that a man has cultural permission. You see how culture is bad. You see what it is telling you to do. You see, this is what we are supposed to fight. Eh? Okay. 
Now, but to the joy of the HIV's campaign, I found this among the, the Basutu. They have come out with a really a proverb that complements the HIV AIDS. They just say that Maho Kediala Haji Samoto, meaning that men should only admire women without any interest in sexual engagement. Eh? Yes. Okay. This, this researcher who is from Kikuyu ethnic group. Let's see what is happening elsewhere. This is not just a South African stereotype. Eh? This is is from Kikuyu ethnic group in Kenya. It's also familiar with a proverb that supports the contents of the above South African proverbs. Eh? Eh, I suspect there is a Kenya who can understand. You know what it's saying? There is no cock that relies on one hand. Where did you see one? Okay, Madam Vice Chancellor, they are bad proverbs and they are concomitant stereotypes pointed to women as sexual objects. It's unfortunate, eh? And have done damage to the process of women's empowerment, eh? These cogentary need to be dismantled. If many of the African countries will ever lower or decimate HIV AIDS in their countries, eh? Now, Uluwaluko is a vessel of HIV AIDS infections now. Eh, paradoxically, Today's initiates display an array of unbecoming behaviors after leaving the initiation school. Enter eh, In opportunity, they engage in maladaptive sexual behaviors, manifest a preponderance of, of beach drinking, a perpetrated violence, and display gruesome behaviors that make them prone to HIV, AIDS, and other sexual transmitted diseases. Eh? Eh, this presents a cultural shock. As the light of traditional musical has always been associated with the factors of inculcating morally elegant behaviors among the initiates, eh? what is apparent today, according to my work in 2020 and 22 with my student and uh, lecturer, uh, is that perhaps signals a dire paradigm shift in the goalpost of the, of the right. It is therefore necessary for the government to work hard in hand with the cultural custodians to address the behavioral deficits that damage the reputation and dignity of the erstwhile sacred light of initiation. A number of cultural researchers point to the possibility of Uluwaluko losing its moral and cultural sanctity. This is according to my work with Mpateni and also with Nomoiya. 2018, uh-huh. This may be attributed to immature cultural custodians who have commercialized the trade. This explains the occurrence of clinical health hazards, hospitalization, and year-in, year-out deaths of insheet. Following the work of Mpateni, Mpateni is a lecturer in uh, Forte, as well as Nongoia, uh, Traditional male circumcision initiate a blessed negative teachings in the initiation school that fails to meet the litmus test of societal, moral, and ethical expectation. What happens in the initiation school reflects non-compliance with the moral code and cultural goals laid down by cultural custodians of the yester years. Eh? In opportunity, the right has often some of its person to to contract HIV AIDS, such as uh, infections such as HIV AIDS, due to misleading teaching that reinforce negative sexual related behaviors to the newly circumcised men. Okay? Due to the clinical hazards associated with Rualuko in some parts of South Africa, such as Lusiki Siki, South Africa, um, South Africa is undergoing a state of shock due to year in and year out health hazard among the the, the, the initiate. This ha has put the culture of traditional male circumstances under doubt. It is continually losing its dignity and cultural grip, as well as becoming a clinical and a social problem. Now, patriarchy, let's talk about patriarchy, disempowers women in the fight against HIV AIDS. Patriarchy refers to the, according to my work, patriarchy refers to power attained by men through culture and customs over time and generations. However, in, ubi in ubiquitous context around the globe, men have used this power to oppress women in, in many ways, whether economically, socially, emotionally, or sexually. 
it in a patriarchal setting power is uh, extremely skilled because of cultural beliefs that disempower women making them not negotiate for safer sex eh? perhaps a paradoxical phenomenon is that most sacred literature of the world such as the bible and Quran, appear to reinforce patriarchy where a man is considered as a reader and a woman as a perpetual follower Yes, in fact, some people believe that patriarchal phenomena have their ideology or the beginning from the popular variegated global sacred literature. Men have therefore used this space to sexually emasculate women and therefore increase their vulnerability. Even though this thinking cuts across many societies in the world, with more impact among African countries, the concept of globalization, development, feminism, and modernization are strongly opposing these by advocating for liberalism and respect for qualification in leadership and decision making. That's the, right, that, that's the route we should take. Eh? Ostensibly, patriarchy has been ident identified as one of the contributing factors to inadequate male involvement in health issues generally. HIV is prevention, not with studying. This according to my work in 2009. This is because women have not been well placed to adequately persuade uh, their male counterpart to use prevention instruments, such as condoms, during sexual engagement. Uh, and geomatically, patriarchy is gender bias in that it places women in a sexual object to satiate, to satiate men's sexual desires. Eh? It takes away women's assertiveness to negotiate fairly for sexual encounters that make them vulnerable to HIV. An offside of patriarchy is condoning deep-rooted conviction that women are not to be heard but only to be seen. This illustrates the position of some women in sexual relationship. Patriarchy in South African contemplates out in subjugating the rights of women through domestic violence. Now the last one, the light of uh, Uluwaluko in condoning alcoholism. This is the last. Unyakwevokare, the traditional male circumcision right around the use of traditional beer or umkomboti. In moderation, the first stages of initiation, and also during umosi, so, which is the seventh day after the circumcision ritual. And in it, it's allowed to eat salty food, eh? it's according to my work eh, eh, in Paten. However, today, the right appears to give young eh, graduated men a list of engaging in alcoholism. Eh, this is sad in that alcohol remains a leading cause of risky sexual behaviors such as unprotected sex and sex with multiple partners. Eh? These behaviors can result in unintended uh, pregnancy and sexual transmitted uh, infections. Um, maybe what I can say is that um, um, South Africa is one of the countries where people are drinking. And uh, we have compared in uh, this uh, table, we have compared where South Africa is among other African countries. While uh, the global, the, 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 the alcohol consumption per capita in Africa is 6.2, for South Africa it is uh, 7.2. What are we saying uh, as I finish? Apparently, uh, there has been an, an, an upward increase in beach drinking and hazardous or harmful drinking. In opportunity, alcohol plays a huge role in about half of all natural uh, deaths. It's attributed to 75% of homicide, 60% of automobile accident, and 24% of vehicle deaths and injuries. In total, 13 million disabilities are just alive here, so 7% of the total disease burden in South Africa are attributed to alcohol. So, okay, further statistics indicate that country state of alcohol uh, contributes massively to carnage. Uh, on the roads, as well as crime and fetal disorders. Uh, now I can conclude, eh? maybe two or three minutes. Eh? Conclusion and the way forward, the social work implication. Eh? Since aid is one of the greatest killers in the country, so that the South African society and government should adopt all possible interventions to reduce or mitigate the spread. Number two, the messaging process of destigmatization of HIV AIDS and the PLD 
P and the PLW themselves need to be increased. This is because of the empirical validation that uh, indeed stigma and stigmatization are strong drivers of increasing the spread. Further, since circumcision has empirically, empirically been proven to reduce HIV experience by 60%, the government needs to stage countrywide campaign to educate or to accept circumcision as a viable avenue to raise the HIV AIDS response. Eh? Uh, members of social service professions such as social workers would be pivotal in the process. It is important that all South African civil society organizations, individuals, NGOs, all public institutions, as well as grassroots leadership structures help South Africans to own, embrace, and advocate for the cultural value of circumcision as an important avenue of reducing incidences of HIV AIDS. However, the government needs to strictly deal with illegal initiation schools to eradicate what we call botched circumcision. But the year in, year out episodes of deaths of the initiates prove beyond doubt that the government is ineffective or dragging its feet in addressing the quagmire of botched uh, circumcision. Apparently, the right of TMC needs to be carried out professionally to save South African youth from becoming endangered species through an avoidable hospitalization, being made a, a losing manhood, and therefore becoming candidate for plastic penises. Uh, imperatively, the parents of children undergoing the right should help the government by ensuring that their children are circumcised in legal institution schools. South African society should not let, let the culture of traditional male soccer be an avenue of learning, drinking behaviors, and other perfidious sexual related behaviors. No. Yes, this calls for multi level interventions targeting high risk drinkers and to create awareness in the general population. The House of Traditional, uh, the House of traditional Affairs should take upon itself the task of ensuring they train especially amakangata, the traditional nurses, so that the right assumes a behavior modifying a defa. Social works consist in such a, a training task. Eh? It is important that scholars, like ourselves, and leadership of all efforts in the country, fight to work against the stereotype that allow men to engage multiple and concurrent partners of it. If HIV in the region will take a significant, a significant downward curve and eventually be annihilated altogether, different religious readers should also work around the clock to advocate for zero tolerance for multiple and concurrent uh, partners. They should reach and advocate for stronger families as well as stronger family values with zero tolerance for sex outside the marital setting. I exhort all to pay attention to the holy biblical scriptures outlawing inadvertent sexual engagement. Finally, all South African residents are implored to apply the values and ethos of Ubuntu to give love to PLWA and show trust and empathy to them to facilitate their journey of positive living. Madam Vice Chancellor, in addition to the above, okay, now these are the, so I wanted to pray this, uh, uh, but uh, since they are not giving, let me give the salutation once again. Let me thank uh, our almighty God for making my academic journey a successful one. Glory be to the living God. Eh? Uh, also, management for offering me uh, employment, especially when my academic uh, uh, Academic motivation was taking a downward trajectory elsewhere. Let me also thank other university organs for support, including our Mtata campus, faculty, and the Department of Social Work and Psychology for giving me professional operations. My beloved wife and my three daughters for perpetually praying for my success in academia, as well as for psychosocial support. My longtime confidant and advisor, Dr. Fusum Siduma, for assisting me in settling on the title and proofreading proof it. My graduated, postgraduate students, there are many, and the ongoing ones, they are listening to me online, who are listening to me. Professor Sone for helping me to professionalize the title. Now, Dr. Robert Kajita, 
Hey, my organized postdoctoral research fellow, for helping me organize and edit uh, the, the lecture and making the photo gallery professionally. I also recognize Mrs. Kajita and my grandson, Lavail Mudaura. My academic sons and daughters, if they are there, yes, the ones I'm mentoring, eh? yes, representative of LAC, uh, the, 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 my church where I fellowship, eh? like uh, him, eh? members whom I fellowship with, I really appreciate you. Last but not least, my students, my esteemed, and, uh, my esteemed students for believing in me and evaluating me to be 100% uh, uh, competent in teaching them. Madam Vice Chancellor, they have said I'm 100%. Eh? Yes, that is good. Eh? Okay, and uh, once again, glory and honor be to our only one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof, for this wonderful. Professor Sone, over to you. permission, let me stand on this established protocol for this hall. Firstly, the Vice Chancellor, represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Senior Directors, Deans, Directors, Professors, and Senior Academics, all other academics, great students of this unique and great university in pursuit of excellence, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, an inaugural lecture provides an academic or scholar who has gained promotion to the professoriate to acquaint a quite diverse audience with what exactly he or she professes. It serves as a justification for an appointment or promotion to the position of professor in a particular discipline. In other words, the professor is expected to give his personal contribution to scholarship over the years of practical teaching and research experience, and this in his new research path for the future. We all have listened to the erudite Professor Kangeti's lecture, or what the French calls parole. His parole has touched, moved, and enlightened us beyond bounds. This is exactly what the Italian classical philosopher talks of literature in the following Latin expression docere, movere, placere. It means we are moved, we are pleased, and we are pleased, and we are enlightened. Although this is not literature, ladies and gentlemen, we are all moved, pleased, and enlightened. Now, this response is structured into three parts. The introduction, points to note as far as this lecture is concerned, and my personal re reaction as an academic. Vice Chancellor, Responding to an inaugural lecture of this magnitude is challenging, especially when you have the vice chancellor and especially the uh, deputy vice chancellor in charge of academic sitting there and looking at you. However, this one comes reinforced by the need for atonement. That is why I count myself fortunate to have been allowed by the vice chancellor and principal to formally respond to Prof. Kangete's professorial inaugural lecture. It is a duty that I hope will discharge me of a burden that I have carried for more than two years since he joined WUSU. A towering academic figure with an impressive career, he always remained humble and kind. In few words, I will describe him as a lambent luminary of extraordinary personality and a terra incognita. Madam Vice Chancellor and Principal, I am responding to this lecture by considering the following. The scope and depth in which the topic has been treated and presented. How his presentation is situated in previous and current discourse in HIV AIDS and other ailments in social work studies. 
His command of formal conventions of scholarship, as well as his attention to social work dynamics, and the scientific merits of, inaugural, of this inaugural address, and his vast contribution to the study of social work. Points to note, as far as this lecture is concerned. In this lecture, Professor Kangete explores various un understandings of the concept of culture, the situation of HIV AIDS in South Africa, as well as other social ills affecting the region, such as the many incidences of gender-based violence. First, he examines how culture, cultural interventions are an asset to fight this maladies and other social ills. And then he proceeds to show how culture, uh, how culture is a liability in the fight against this ease. He unpacks the concept of culture in various contexts of the world, but takes a stand in his approach. To Kangete, culture is the foundation of which behaviors, specifically human behaviors, are expressed and through which health must be defined and understood. Quoting from various statistical sources, Kangete shows how out of 39 million people affected worldwide by HIV AIDS, 8.5 are from South Africa. But most importantly, our province, the Eastern Cape, has the third highest prevalence rate of 25%, coming behind the Free State with 25.5% and KwaZulu-Natal with 27%. These figures, according to Kangete, make South Africa the country with the highest number of people with the disease. He knows that since AIDS is the greatest killer in the country, the South African society and government should adopt all possible interventions to reduce or mit mitigate the spread. Another kankawom which Kangete has touched in his presentation and which is eating deep into the fabric of our society is gender-based violence in all its forms and manifestations. Kangete considered it not only painful and horrendous, but dehumanizing demon that calls for social, cultural, physical, emotional, and spiritual exorcism. We know this is a very sensitive and a touching issue which our vice chancellor is bent on addressing. Many of us will attest to the fact that she has initiated a book series on which this issue is divided into three sections, Name It, Tame It, and Shame It. The first volume on Name It is at the production stage now with Jota. I think Professor Nora and Dr. Kanyuza will bear with me on this. Now, I don't want to go very much far on this, but I want to touch mostly on my reactions on this uh, issue. My reaction to Professor Kangete's lecture. Professor Kangete's presentation is in the field of social work, but particularly uh, on the paradoxical nature of HIV AIDS and social ills as it relates to culture and society in South Africa, where he displays an awesome knowledge and a firm grasp of the subject. His exposition is clear and even-handed. His account is lucid and thoughtful, and he accomplishes this within the framework of a searching yet coherent argument. His lecture has once more demonstrated that Prof has once more demonstrated Prof Kangete's jolting ability of raising questions, finding answers and aligning the answers so, such that new knowledge is gained and ultimately newer questions are asked. And this is the clearest evidence of advancing scholarship. This is a level of scholarship that is continually displayed, not only in his presentation, but in his research and publications. Madam Vice Chancellor, if I am asked to describe Professor Kangate briefly, I would say without hesitation, that, Prof, you are, you are an illustrious colleague, a teacher, a prolific intellectual, an acclaimed scholar of broad interest and notable achievement, a versatile researcher of great skill and integrity, and you are a fine gentleman. You have been and you are still several things to several people, a friend one can count on all times, a mentor 
who, were, who spares no effort to help colleagues to grow, an eminent colleague who is always ready to share his knowledge and ideas and a fervent believer in equity, including respect for the dignity of all human beings. Grand Frere, as I used to call you, big brother, I am proud of you. The distinguished Nigerian scholar Chinua Achebe has it in Arrow of God that wisdom is like a good skin bag. Everyone carries his own. Professor Kangete has brought his own wisdom here and he has shared with us. We are all grateful. Let us consume it. Let us masticate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Sonne. Prof. MTM, please come and do your thing. The thing she's going to do, she's going to honor Prof. now. Can I request Prof. Kangete to come and join me? That's a precious moment. Every academic's dream is that one. I'm sure all of us are going to walk that walk one day. <laughs> Professor Luf, please come and share the congratulatory message. Program Director, Professor Nganwa, Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs and Research, Professor Tabana Maselesele, Acting Campus Rector, Professor Trishe, members of the Senior Leadership Committee, members of WSU Senate, special guests in particular the family of Professor Simon Kangete, friends of the Faculty of Law, Humanities, and Social Sciences, deans of other faculties, staff and students of Walter Sisuli University, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. The only way to congratulate you, Professor Kangete, is to do so in true academic spirit, which is to point out the value of this most edifying lecture you have just delivered. Your research aims for meaningful impact as it tackles societal ills that are related to HIV, masculinities, circumcision, and gender-based violence all painted on the canvas of culture. You point us to look where it is difficult, in our cherished institutions and their cultural practices, where we also find our foibles and blind spots. Indeed, as the accomplished academic that you are, you pointed out how culture and its performances or expressions is a double-edged sword, at once a source of our ills and also our salvation. I could not agree with you anymore that we require cultural adjustments and realignments to make South Africa a humane and safe place for all, particularly the vulnerable. You would not be the consummate academic that you are 
if you did not remind us that HIV AIDS is still with us and will be for a while, and that only a nuanced engineering of culture can lead to the end of this scourge. You made the same erudite argument for gender-based violence, and you did this clearly and convincingly well done. You were essentially saying to us, while there is a lot of pride in our identities that are an intersection of race, ethnicity, class, and gender, we should, each and every one of us, bystanders, perpetrators, or champions of cultural change, play a part towards regeneration. You spoke of collective social responsibility through Ubuntu. Personally, you reminded me of how as a heteronormative male, I have power and privilege that I must use for the betterment of society and not its weakening. We thank you then and congratulate you for disrupting our taken for granted understanding of culture and for challenging us to be more vigilant in our performances of culture. We congratulate you for the finesse in the delivery of your lecture, the memorable statistics, and your faith in human beings to change adversity into opportunity. Deputy Vice Chancellor Dawana Maselesele, I also congratulate Prof Kangete for the sterling work he has done and continues to do in the faculty. Apart from being the effective postgraduate supervisor that we all know him to be, we fervently thank and congratulate Professor Kangete for the various pastoral roles he has played and continues to play in the faculty in rendering all manner of support to staff and students. Most tellingly, he is the chairperson of the Staff Mentorship Committee under whose mentorship several staff have authored their first publications. This alone epitomizes the person that Prof. Kangete is, progressive and selfless. He firmly believes, as our faculty does, that the work of professors is to make other professors. As a prayerful Christian, Professor Kangete, I can only thank you by imploring the Almighty to give you a long and productive life in which you continue to uplift and inspire others. Asante sana, Malimu Nku. You are standing between us and that thing called food. Molueni, kutetu languages, abandu zaabo. Professor I'm not going to say Akiri. Uh, today, fortunately, Professor Masada said I didn't say so. I was listening attentively for her to say Akiri. The Vice Chancellor in absentia, represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor today, who is wearing two, shoe, two hats or big shoes, Walter Sisulu Executive Management Committee, senior, leader, senior leaders, Senate members here, deans, HODs, academics, staff members, students, colleagues watching online, the family of Professor Kangete, Good afternoon. Mine is a short one, it's two, 
thank everyone here. Let me start with Professor Toto next to me. I don't call her Professor Nganya for reasons known to me. I call her Professor Toto. Thank you very much, Martha Mini, for directing this program. You know that I kept on texting you, and you know what we're talking about, the two of us. Today's Vice Chancellor and Principal, also the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs, well, let me not say so, because she's Deputy Vice Chancellor for everything at WSU. As we all know, you give her research and innovation, teaching and learning, community engagement, everything. She's a master of all. That is our lady with a very black hairstyle. <laughs> Pass our gratitude to the Vice Chancellor, who you represented today. You have not failed her. You did very well in all the activities that she was supposed to, to perform. We thank you for that. And also thank you for playing your own role I thought you were going to ask someone to play your own role, but you managed to play all the roles. We are proud of having you. And colleagues will know my passion about ladies, especially when they perform well. I'm very passionate about that. I'm not going to get it wrong now, DBC. The Faculty of Law, Humanities and Social Sciences. Yes, correct. We thank you, Professor Ndlovu and your faculty for showing the university that it is possible to inaugurate two professors within six months. The other one was in May, and today is the second one. And I know there's another one who's likely to be coming soon, very soon. Other faculties, where are you? I only see one thing. You have a challenge that it is possible and it can be done. Thank you for raising the bar, as the DVC said earlier on. You have raised the bar, and it is time that everybody follows and they do the same. I know the DVC will be pushing everyone next year and say, yes, it's time. You must inaugurate professors because that is a way to profess, as Professor Sona has said so. Professor Kangete, before coming to you, let me thank your family. The wife that is the mother of your three daughters, we are here for you because of the support they have given you. It's unfortunate that they could not be with us. We thank you, Mama Kangete, and the children for all the support you have given her, him, I'm sorry. You know, when he first arrived here, there was this professor who liked talking. And at times I would be bored, say, hey, this professor in Senate meetings, he's going to raise his hand. And I was saying, ah, at times I could not even hear what he was saying. I have no doubt that some of you could not hear everything that he was saying. There was even a time that he was whispering, Prof, thank you very much. And then there was this time that the media came down because they could not hear you. And I realized later that he was demonstrating Ubuntu and how Ubuntu can be demonstrated. Thank you for lecturing us about HIV and AIDS and other societal ills. Having said so, thank you for venturing into the profession or career that was known to be a female-dominated one. For us, we used to say that uh, social workers can be only men, women, not men, but we have people like you, and we have role models that young ones should look into and know that it can be made. 
Prof. Sonne, you responded very well. You explained further to what the DVC said earlier on as to what is an inaugural lecture, that it is a way that one has to profess what the person is doing and the person has been doing. You did very well and the professor professed very, very well. Thank you for that. The dean, I'm not going to use the, the, the name I normally call you with. I have my own names for everybody here, but I'm not going to use those names in case I find you using my own names. Thank you for congratulating the newly inaugurated professor, Professor Kangete. He is in your faculty and you had to do it because there was no one who could do it best. You know him better than any other person. Academics with academic pro pro procession in front here, all academics, some attending virtually, the friends of the faculty, WSU friends, Professor Kangete and his family friends, students, especially those that are supervised by Professor Kangete, thank you very much for coming here and honoring this lecture. Without you, we're not going to get or to have this attendance. Can you give yourselves a big round of applause? Media at the back, I know whenever we have an activity here, we always have media honoring our activity. I've seen messages that other colleagues are already watching what is happening on YouTube. And even some of us, when we go back, we'll have to listen to what was taking place here. Maybe there will be a way to hear what Professor Kangeta was whispering. Well, there were times that he was whispering, and I was wondering as to what was wrong. Thank you for always with us. We have a tendency to forget MCD, and they're the people who work behind the scene for the success of everything. ED, I can see you at the back, although the big head is partly hiding you. We have all seen Fundi, moving up and, and down the team, and also the paparazzis also doing what they do best, and we'll be looking at that. Thanks to everyone. Let's give everybody, all of us, a big round of applause. As we will be leaving this auditorium, the DVC, because the, the Vice Chancellor is not here now, let me say the DVC is inviting all of us up to the executive dining hall to get some coffee, because my mother used to say when it is hot, you need to get a warm coffee so that the heat gets out of you. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you, Sis Banja. Uh, colleagues, uh, what we are going to do now, we are going to leave the hall, but uh, please, uh, because this is a very educated uh, ceremony, so we're going to start by the procession, the DVC will lead us, and then the Dr. Nguza will follow from there, and also the those the gowns they will follow until they leave and finish the room. Then we will all follow to the same to the same area. So allow me. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Banja. I'm thanking you for thanking us. Thank you, and for allowing us to come to your campus. It is not a small thing to do that especially the research office is very humble about that. Colleagues, I'm gonna sing Ngosi Sigelele Africa. All of us, we're gonna stand up and sing Ngosi Sigelele Africa. Then after that one, we, the procession, the DVC will lead us. 
Gosisi keleli Afrika, malu pakami su. Sokke, sokke! 